Welcome fellow recovering traditionalists to episode 188, the science of making math stick, using brain research to combat the NAEP score crisis. Welcome to Build Math Minds, the podcast, where fidelity to your students is greater than fidelity to your textbook. I'm your host, Christina Tonnevold, the recovering traditionalist and buildmathminds.com founder, where my mission is to change the way we teach elementary math to our kiddos. So are you ready to start building math minds and not just creating calculators? Let's get started. In this episode, I had planned to share previews from our upcoming virtual math summit. But then the 2024 NAEP scores got released and I actually saw how some of the sessions relate to those scores. So I am gonna share it, but just before we get started, if you haven't registered for the free summit, you can do that over at virtualmathsummit.com and you're gonna get 10 days to watch all the sessions. The first session gets released February 22nd and it's all weekend, the 22nd and the 23rd. If you are already registered, but you're thinking you want more than the 10 days you get for free, go to virtualmathsummit.com slash upgrade to see your options for extended access. All right, let's talk about something that's critical for every math educator, helping our students actually retain what they are learning. This is timely given the latest NAEP results. I am not one who thinks that standardized tests should be the end all be all. However, I do think we need to pay attention to them and use the results for reflection and planning. The 2024 Nations Report Card, which is the report of the NAEP scores, came out recently and it shows some mixed results, I guess you could say. Uh, there's a bit of good news, Fourth grade math scores did improve by three points compared to 2022, but what new stories I've seen are not reporting is that that's only 49% of, sorry, not 49, 39% of fourth graders who are performing at or above the proficient level. And in eighth grade scores, they gained two points compared to 2022, but that wasn't enough to overcome the eight point drop that happened in 2022. Only about 28% of eighth graders are performing at or above the proficient level, and nearly 40% are working below basic. So even if we look back further, we are now four years after the pandemic, and we're still below our 2019 scores, which I know I don't have to tell you because so many of you feel it. You've feel like you are constantly trying to play catch up to helping your students kind of fill those gaps in learning. So today I want to share some powerful insights from two of our upcoming virtual math summit presenters who offer research backed strategies for helping students truly retain their mathematical learning. Michaela Epstein and Jen Hunt both dive deep into how students learn and retain mathematical concepts and their research-based approaches could help us address some of these concerning trends we're seeing in the NAEP data. I've been spending my time grabbing clips from Summit sessions in the hopes that sharing them might give you just one new idea, even if you don't actually attend the Summit, okay? So let's start by understanding why students forget. Jen Hunt explains in her session that our working memory has significant limitations. All right, topic three, working memory. Get your hand out and tap your forehead. Uh, five fingers if you're able, pop, 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 pop. Think of those as little post-it notes sitting here in your working memory. Working memory is that temporary place where information can be held. Math guru and my math spirit animal, Lisa McConchie, says that uh, our working memory has about five post-it notes and we can hold on to those not very long. I mean, not longer than five minutes. So you're not holding on to that information very long. 30 seconds to a few minutes, like maybe. Uh, and so those five, I call them really fragile. They're really fragile, that working memory. And you can only hold about five pieces of information. Well, there's a lot of things in math that require functional working memory. And that's one of the reasons that learning isn't sticking. 
is because math is requiring it, but that doesn't necessarily mean that our students have a lot of functionality in their working memory. Here's why. So when presented with too much information at once, students simply can't hold on to it all. And five sticky notes are our typical students. She goes on to explain that neurodivergent learners, it's more like two or three sticky notes that they have to hold information. So many of our students are experiencing this cognitive overload, causing them to not be able to retain the information they're learning. In both Jen and Michaela's sessions, they give tips on how to help with this. One key factor in retention and reducing the overload is timing. Both Jen and Michaela Epstein talk about the forgetting curve. Here's Michaela explaining it. So we've got a, a disparity happening in how we ideally practice versus what we do in reality. Um, and I want to share a couple of graphs with you that start to dig out why the ideal might look different. So this is a graph um, that comes from a researcher by the name of Herman Ebbinghaus. And maybe you've heard of it. It's commonly known as the forgetting curve. Um, there are a couple of things that are fascinating about this particular graph. Firstly, the data collected by Ebbinghaus was in the late 1800s, yet this is a graph that is still shared and relevant today. And that's because it's been replicated over time. So let me just break down what we've got in, going on in this graph. Along the x-axis going along the bottom is the number of days since the learning happened. So it starts from zero and then you get towards, um, you know, over a month. And on the y-axis going up, we've got the per percentage of information retained. So of what was learned, how much is then remembered. And what you can see in this graph is there is a very sharp decline. Even within the first hour, a huge chunk of information is quickly forgotten. Um, and I think this is a really interesting one in terms of considering, well, what parallels there might be for our students in maths. Um, and especially when they're going through their day and learning a huge amount, not just in maths, but across all different subjects. Now, if you are just listening to the audio of this episode, what you can't see is that graph. And it shows that students forget around 70% of what they've learned within the first 24 hours. We've all had those times where we cram for a test and we can retain that information for that test. And those study sessions work for short term, but as we will hear Michaela say later, information can be learned quickly, but not very securely. This research about the forgetting curve really highlights why we need to be intentional about how we structure our math instruction. We can combat these challenges with the right strategies, and both presenters share research-backed strategies that can help reverse this trend. One of the most powerful findings that they discuss is called basically dual coding theory. Research shows that when we combine visual and verbal information, all students retain information better, not just our visual learners. This isn't about different learning styles, it's just about how the human brain processes and stores information. Given that 40% of our eighth graders are working below basic in math, we need to be intentional about making mathematical concepts visual for all our learners. Another powerful way to increase retention is through engagement. Here's Jen Hunt explaining the science behind one of my own personal favorite math activities, and how it can be so powerful. Number five, dopamine. So dopamine, as you remember, is the neurotransmitter associated with motivation and reward. Dopamine does a lot of things in our bodies, but one of the things that it does is actually strengthens learning and memory. Uh, how fantastic is that? So activities where we can increase dopamine or cause dopamine to happen for students are actually really beneficial to their learning. Guess what does release dopamine? It's math games. Math games release a lot of dopamine for kids. And I highly encourage math games. 
not just because they're engaging, not just because they make kids feel empowered in their own learning, not just because they teach those soft skills of taking turns, sharing, um, of winning gracefully, losing gracefully, not, not just because they teach kids how to manage supplies and teach kids how to manage themselves, but also because there's a lot going on with dopamine. It actually helps them learn it in a different way and remember it better because they're not being asked to do something that uh, feels too hard for them. They're being asked to, it might, be, it might be too hard for them, but they don't seem to care as much when they play a game. So I've watched students be really effective in their math learning just because they're playing a math game, and it's really worth their time. Kids play to learn. Of all ages, fifth and sixth graders play to learn too. So if we can get them to play, we're actually getting them to do the work of math while they're doing a game. I absolutely love math games as a way to have students practice math concepts. And speaking of practice, how we space it out matters tremendously. There is research about doing mass practice, like all at once, versus spaced out practice. And then here's Michaela again. So in this graph, again, we've got the number of days going along the x-axis and the percentage of information retained going along the y. But this time what's happened is on a regular basis, that initial information has been reviewed. And every time that review has happened, the memory of it, the memory of that learning has gone back up to the top again. Okay, so what we're seeing here is that by revisiting old content, that memory gets stronger. Um, now, Rodiger and Pai from um, did some research in 2012, and they explained if information is repeated back to back, so in that massed um, kind of fashion, you know, 20 questions all at once sort of thing, um, it's often learned quickly, but not very securely. So that forgetting happens. But if information is repeated in this distributed pa uh, pattern, like we can see in this graph, uh, it's learned more slowly, but it's retained for much longer. Now, interestingly, this graph is very important because it's not just happened in one context. In fact, um, Dunlowski and colleagues in 2013, they reviewed contemporary research in this area, and they found that this um, idea of the space practice has a large effect across a range of students, um, ages, topics, and forms of assessment. Okay, so actually this is a very robust finding um, and it, even uh, like the effect gets stronger when you start to increase the spacing between the reviews over time. So again, I invite you to just have a think about what that might mean for your students in maths and how this research finding could be used to help your students. These research-based insights give us clear direction for how we can help our students retain mathematical learning better. Let's talk about three practical strategies you can start using tomorrow. First, space out practice instead of massing it all together. Instead of doing all the problems at once, spread them out over time so that you can revisit concepts. Michaela and Jen suggest incorporating quick reviews of previous content into your daily routines. This might look like starting each lesson doing a quick number string, right? You can review concepts in a number string and connect it, the current learning to previous learning. Second, make mathematical concepts both visual and verbal. Kids need the visuals of the mathematical concepts. When students can see a concept and talk about it, they're more likely to remember it. Given the NAEP results showing widening gaps between our high and low performers, this strategy could be particularly helpful for our struggling learners, but it really is important for all learners. But I do wanna highlight that often with our struggling learners, we think we need to hurry to catch them up so that we, we just wanna jump straight into teaching and explaining the formal algorithms instead of letting kids explore. But slow down help them build that foundation of understanding that isn't there for them. One of my mantras that I encourage teachers to use all the time is 
slow down to speed up, slow down to speed up. And one of the ways you can do that is incorporating lots of visuals for those kiddos. Third, support turning working memory into long-term memory by ensuring that you take one to two minutes at the very least to revisit the main idea from a lesson. I didn't share a clip of that from the session that Jen has, but she makes such a great case for this in her session. After an hour, the forgetting curve has dipped dramatically. So at the end of a lesson, we need to make sure that we revisit that main idea with our students to bring it back into that, that forefront of their mind, okay? Looking at the 2024 NAEP results, it really is clear that we do need to make some shifts. The fact that nearly 40% of eighth graders are working below basic really suggests that many students aren't retaining those fundamental concepts. By understanding how the brain learns and retains information, we can make intentional shifts in our instruction that will help students truly learn and remember mathematics. All right, if you're interested in learning more, get registered for the free virtual math summit to watch the full sessions by both Jen Hunt and Michaela Epstein. Jen's session dives deep into how the brain learns mathematics, while Michaela's session focuses specifically on helping students retain what they learn. Register at virtualmathsummit.com. Michaela's session is on Saturday, February 22nd, and Jen's is on the second day, Sunday, February 23rd. But if you can't be there when the sessions get released, everyone who is registered has through March 3rd to watch the replays. Until next week, my fellow recovering traditionalists, keep letting your students explore math, keep questioning, and most importantly, keep building math minds.